Hi, I'm Nate Simpson, Creative Director for KSP2. Welcome to our first dev chat, where we have a quick conversation with one of our developers about an upcoming feature. Today, we're going to be talking to Chris Mortock Mortensen, our senior graphics engineer, about the re entry VFX system. Let's see what he's got to show us. This is Mortock. Mortock, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mortock. I'm the uh, senior graphics uh, engineer on the team here. Mortok's been working on a new re-entry effect to go along with this new thermal system we've been working on. Um, do you want to talk to us a little bit about what you've been building? Sure. So we're, uh, we've looked at a lot of ways that uh, re-entry is done across a lot of different games, including KSP1. Um, and it seems to be like not a very solved graphics problem. The approach we're taking is kind of like a new approach. The effect itself, the way this works, is we generate a kind of a blob around each part. Then we kind of, we use all the heat dynamic calculations to offset parts of that blob mesh around the original mesh. Um, it kind of gives us this nice interior detail here. You can kind of see the, the bits that these wires are adding to it and everything. And you also get these like, these kind of concave sections on this part. We get these nice like streaks that shoot through there as well use this little debug tool to see the re-entry from different directions. What are the unique problems for KSP2 that needed to be solved? I don't know if it's unique to KSP2, but just having a reliable, um, scalable effect. So something that's going to be able to go on, you know, someday when we have interstellar ships or colonies, like we're definitely going to want to shoot, like crash one of those into an atmosphere at some point. So we need something that's going to scale across hundreds of parts of very different sizes. It's generally it's just not a thing that's been done a lot in graphics. There's only a few kind of games, and a lot of it, a lot of games do it in a very hand wavy sort of way. So would you say that the system is a little bit more performant than previous ap approaches that we've taken? Yeah, the the technique in KSP one is what's called a fur shader, where you have like a lot of shells of mesh and you kind of blend them together, which is why you can kind of see like a graininess and like kind of this. Um, repeating layered pattern through it. You could solve that by throwing even more mesh at it. It's a very kind of brute force uh, approach. This approach is not doing that. This is just an additive shader blend, which is a cheap um, effect. Most of the expensive part is done offline here by using Houdini. So you can see the part here, this input. Um, so the part that's facing like towards the direction that we're re-entering the atmosphere from. That part just stays put. That's what we're seeing here in these bright parts. And then the parts that are you know, facing away from it get shifted back. Because the mesh kind of follows the shape of the surface here, we get all sorts of really interesting um, detail that kind of spread through the parts. It moves a lot of the work to offline processing. If we had to calculate this kind of blob mesh on the fly per frame, that would be bad for performance. Having it done ahead of time, we could do just simple shader stuff on top of it. It looks really nice. I actually haven't seen it in a few days, and even just from the last time I saw it, it's, it's gorgeous. Do you have any future plans or any specific way that you've architected this system to accommodate different atmospheric compositions, oh, yeah. different densities? Yeah, let's do that right now. Let's change the color of this effect. This is our orange, what we read as fire. Let's just go ahead and make it something ridiculous. Let's go purple into, I don't know, like cyan. That feels good. And then we'll re-import that into Unity. Now we have whatever, whatever planet this is. So like, what we can do is basically get the science behind it, like figure out what color would the plasma actually be on different planets. Like, you know those experiments where you throw copper into a fire and it's a different color? I wanted to think about doing that, but I realized that the plasma is not the part heating up, so it's not actually the copper, it's the air around it. So that, that wouldn't be scientifically accurate, despite it would probably look really sweet. Unless the atmosphere is made of copper. Yeah, unless it has bits of copper mixing in to get us this rainbow effect. The atmospheric composition will be whatever it is on different planets, so we can, you know, talk to a science man and get some science colors out of it. Chris Adderley has done a huge amount of research around what color the plasmas actually should be on each celestial body, so yeah. I think we're, we're set there. I can't wait. Thanks a lot, Chris. Flash more time. Yeah, thank you. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. As a treat, here's a glimpse at some things that are coming up.
Hey, Mortak. How you doing? Hi, Nate. <laughs> All right. <laughs>